Welcome to Women Making a Difference, PJSAO Women Who Inspire and Motivate. How are you today? Good, how are you? Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. I mean, you know, you do great work here in the office, and I really wanted uh, the community to get to know you a little bit. So often they get to hear from me as the elected uh, state's attorney here in Prince George's County, uh, but the work that you do is incredible, and you are protecting our most vulnerable citizens and residents here in the county. So why don't you uh, tell our audience um, you know, about the unit that you oversee in the work that you're doing? Sure. So our unit is um, the Special Victims and Family Violence Unit. We prosecute cases involving domestic violence, sexual assault, child physical and sexual abuse, and child exploitation. We also handle human trafficking cases in our office um, because they so often overset. And so I know that you deal with very, very sensitive cases, oftentimes involving families and people who know each other. So I know that that can be very emotional. Uh, how does that, that work, the work that you're doing, how does it affect you personally? You know, it's hard to not, like you said, it's hard for it to not affect you, but you know, it's such important work. Um, and, and so I, you know, try to, decompress, I, you know, exercise, I have a family, we try not to discuss my cases, but it's hard, you know, these, these cases are, are very difficult. Um, you're, you're seeing people at their worst points. Um, and, you know, it's hard to not really just kind of carry that with you throughout um, your, your day. Yeah, absolutely. And, and because the work that you do is so sensitive and oftentimes, let's say in the cases uh, dealing with domestic violence, oftentimes you don't necessarily have cooperative victims or witnesses who are willing to cooperate. How do you, how do you deal with that aspect of the work that you do? So I think uh, myself and the, and the other attorneys in our unit, we have a really deep understanding of domestic violence. You know, we come in because we're passionate about helping um, survivors, um, but we know that, you know, it takes a woman or a man seven times to leave a abusive relationship. And when we're prosecuting our cases, we understand that sometimes these victims are in the throes of it and they can't extract themselves from it. And it's not because they're bad people or because they like being abused. It's because it really is a cycle of psychological violence. And so we have to understand that. And so it can be frustrating, um, but we have to come from a place of understanding um, and I think we do. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I, I've, see, I've seen the care uh, that not just you, but the prosecutors in your unit take uh, with the victims, with families. Um, and, and, and also, let me give a shout out to our victim witness coordinators. I mean, they are amazing. amazing. And they take calls around the clock. Uh, really do. You can imagine, uh, you know, because if a victim needs to talk and maybe is having a breakthrough, you, you want to be able to be there for that victim, right? Or if Absolutely. they finally want to leave and you're like, okay, great, we can get you into safe housing. We want to do that right away. Absolutely. Because these are sometimes life and death decisions that, that the victims are making. And uh, so, so tell us about that. Like, tell us how, you know, like, tell us about maybe one or two of your most challenging cases and, 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 how it, how it impacted you and, and what were the outcomes in those cases? Yeah, so I think the first one that, um, that really comes to mind is one of the first felony uh, DV cases I tried um, about 10 years ago, more than that maybe now, um, and involved uh, a woman and a man who were from Virginia. They actually, um, she had been charged with making a false report because she had reported domestic violence and then said she lied and Virginia charged her. And then her boyfriend broke some of her ribs and he had an open warrant um, and so they came over, they were hiding out because he had an open warrant in, um, actually in Anne Arundel County. They got into an argument. Um, he ultimately kind of dragged her in the car, kidna kidnapping her, um, and drove around for several hours just beating her. Um, she was just very, very bloody to the point where he almost ran out of gas. And so he ran out of gas or was running out of gas in Prince George's County. He pulls into um, a gas station in Bowie um, and she's able to get out of the car and the uh, gas station attendants find her, um, put, you know, she's bloodied and beaten, um, going in and out of consciousness. They pull her into the gas station um, and they call the police and he flees. Uh, and she 
she doesn't cooperate at first. Um, she, she doesn't want to prosecute. She refuses to say who did it. Um, and the case kind of goes stale for a little bit. Um, and then a few months later, um, he's arrested for assaulting her again in Virginia, um, this time with like, I think a mop, he broke um, more of her ribs. And I don't know if that was, that was the impetus, but that was when she was ready. Um, when he was arrested, he was arrested with the um, photographs of the injuries from my assault on his person that he carried around to just like show her what she, um, what he could do to her if she didn't listen. Um, and so, you know, I, it was a, it was a long trial. It was one of those trials where I had like my Perry Mason moment. Cause, um, the, I found the, um, the, the gas station attendants, even though it was like two years later and they recognized him still, the guy who came in, the defendant who came in and they were like, that's the guy. And they, and I was like, Oh, I wish this was recorded because I, this is my one moment. Um, and so he was convicted and then I'll never forget we had sentencing and he had been sentenced to, I think, 12 years in Virginia, um, for the assault. And he came in and it was a really long sentencing and, you know, we were asking for a lot of time, um, because he had been terrorizing, um, this victim and, um, you know, I didn't know whether the judge was going to give it to me. And then the defendant says in his allocution, he turns around to the victim and says, you're mine, you'll always be mine. Wow. And I was like, it, you know, I think everyone in the courtroom just kind of fell silent. Um, so that case just always kind of sticks with me because you really think about the cycle of violence. She wasn't ready to leave at first, but she had, you know, prosecutors and law enforcement who stuck by, st stood by her um, and were, was able to finally get her justice. That's amazing. And, and I know that you get justice a lot for our victims. And I know there are cases where we just aren't, aren't able to move forward because we need the victim in order to make the case and the victim does not cooperate. And, and we can't even be angry at the victim because like you said, we understand that cycle of violence. But when we look at the stats and we look at uh, you know, especially when uh, victims, uh, and, and I really want you to talk about this, uh, victims who, you know, are victims of strangulation. Uh, when, when, when you know that it's more likely that they may end up um, dead, and, and I'm just going to say it plainly because that's just how we have to talk here. Um, how do you, how do you reconcile, you know, having to having to dismiss a case because we ethically can't move forward if we don't believe we have the evidence and if we don't have the victim, uh, sometimes we need them in order to have sufficient evidence. How do you reconcile that? Like, what, what, and then what else do we offer them even if we can't move forward with the prosecution? What, what else can we do to, to, or what else do we do to assist our victims? Yeah, so I think I look at it in two ways. One time, the first way I look at it is that the victim really knows her, whether or not she's safe, you know, whether or not prosecuting this case is going to make her less safe. And that is sometimes the case, right? She can't get out from under it, you know, financially because of, or for many other reasons, you know, they have kids in common. She doesn't think or see a path of a way um, to kind of get away from this individual. And I say she, because we know predominantly um, women are, are victims, but we do know that there are men who are also victims of, um, of domestic violence. And so sometimes I reconcile it with, you know, she thinks that this is the best way to keep her safe. And then the second way is that, you know, I think that we have a problems in our criminal justice system, but we have a, one of the best criminal justice systems in the world. If, you know, you, if you take out um, some of the issues that we need to kind of change and that's because we have to prove these cases that I can't just make an accusation against somebody and they should go to jail. You know, it, the, the burden that's on the prosecutor is there to ensure that um, an innocent person doesn't go to jail. And so, you know, while it's difficult because I know, you know, in cases that we don't have a cooperative victim that they're sometimes going back into the same kind of cycle. Um, I know that, you know, I, I have to trust that the system is going to do, um, what it can for her. And we always offer services, even when I can't go forward, even when they don't want to talk to me, I tell them, you know, when you're ready, we're here, you know, we, we, you don't have to go forward, but we have housing services, or we can offer you, you know, social, um, social services with the county, and we, you know, put them in touch with the Family Justice Center, which is such a huge um, partner of us. And we just try to work with them where they are, and we meet them where they are, and then hope that, you know, we hope for the best. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And 
um, the kind of care and compassion I think that you have shown and, and which is one of the uh, it's one of the the things that made me so so proud to be able to promote you while you've been here to chief is because you know you, you are thoughtful and practical and you, you kind of have to be both in this in this line of work um, but you're also very proactive as well and uh, last year or I guess earlier this year really um, we worked uh, very hard and we were able to pass legislation uh, that made strangulation a first degree felony here in, in, in or first degree assault. So it's a felony now, assault in Maryland. Can you talk about how significant that was for the work that you're doing? And then also the trainings that you're now doing for our law enforcement partners? Yeah, I mean, it was it was huge. I know it, it's something that we had tried to pass for 12 years. And so we really appreciate you taking that on because it had been a really long time coming. Um, and I think your leadership is what kind of got us past the finish line. Um, but, you know, we know that victims of strangulation are 750 times more likely to become victims of domestic violence homicide. And, you know, we have seen, unfortunately, here in Prince George's County, um, the results of that. You know, the, the newest um, domestic violence fatality review committee shows that I think out of the, I think, five homicides that we reviewed, three of them had strangulation incidences that were either reported or unreported, but incidences that happened. And so now having that ability um, to hold offenders accountable before we get to the homicide, I think is going to save lives. And so, you know, we were what the 48th state, I think the past right. <laughs> the felony. So it was a long time coming. I think the rest of the, the country has recognized the dangers of strangulation. Um, and so, you know, I think it's going to, I think it's gonna save lives. Absolutely. And you're doing some trainings now for the sheriff's office, for our police department and, and other municipal officers around our county. So can you talk a little bit about the trainings that you're doing? Yeah, so we are um, telling them about the dangers of strangulation. We are showing them how they can um, they can investigate it properly. So that what they what they should look for, because a lot of times people think, oh, if they don't have any injuries. That means that the strangulation didn't happen. And we know that that's not true. You know, everybody's um, complexion is different. Everybody bruises differently. And so we're looking and showing them, you know, this is what you need to be looking for. And so we're going in, we're training them on the dangers of strangulation, uh, how to conduct a proper investigation, um, and making sure that they are prepared October 1st to start charging these cases as felonies. Absolutely. And and, and we're, we know that this is going to save lives. And we know that, you know, the work that you're doing is really important work. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, I think we could probably talk forever because we have, like, there's so much work that your your unit does, and we'll probably have to have you back because I really want to go into, uh, you know, human trafficking a little bit more because I think people really don't understand uh, what it looks like. And, and the fact that you can have a child who comes home every single day, but that doesn't mean that that person is not being trafficked. And so uh, I think we, we're going to have to have you back again, really just to kind of go into detail on that as well. Um, but um, I wanted to give you an opportunity before uh, we leave today just to talk about, you know, or, or just to give some, some words uh, of encouragement to those who may be interested in the law. Hopefully some of them are thinking about becoming prosecutors. Like what advice would you give someone who's considering law? Yeah, you know, I, you know, I've wanted to be a prosecutor forever. I can't, I have a little picture that I drew when I was in first grade um, of me being a prosecutor. And I think, you know, and it, it, I, that's just who I was. And I know people think that defense attorneys and they do play a vital role in our criminal justice system, but really the prosecutor has so much power. Um, and to have people who are thoughtful about that power, to have people who care and care about the, the injustices that we see today is so important. And so I would encourage you, if you want to be a lawyer, to think about being a prosecutor because the role of the prosecutor, you know, we have to consider the defendant, we consider the community, we consider, you know, the victim, and we try to come to a thoughtful um, resolution that is fair and just. And if we have people who are like-minded, who think first about, you know, making sure that our social and racial injustices are kind of being met, um, will move towards a more perfect criminal justice system. So I would encourage you to, to come over to the prosecution side because you do have the ability to change lives 
um, the defendant's lives for the better too. It's not just, you know, I tell people when they first come to this office, my job is not to just lock people up. Um, that's not my job. My job is to get justice. Sometimes that means people have to go to jail, but sometimes it means diversion. Sometimes it means getting people the help that they need. Um, and we need more prosecutors like, like that. Absolutely. And thank you so much. And thank you for your leadership in the office and the important work that you're doing. So until next time, everyone, thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to seeing you again. Thanks. Okay. I think we're good. Thank you so much, Melissa. No problem. Thank uh, you. Okay. Have a great one. Bye. You too. Bye-bye.